social reformer, peace activist, labor, labor supporter, and founder of Hull House, Jane Addams, was born into a wealthy family in 1860 in Cedarville, Illinois, the eighth of nine children. Her father, John H. Adams, was an affluent businessman who was involved in numerous businesses throughout his life, including insurance, railroad, real estate, mill owner, woolen factor, and banker. Adams was also a local and state politician who served for 16 years as a state senator. Jane's early life was marred by her mother's death when she was only two years old. Her older sister Mary took over the care of Jane and her three siblings until Jane's father re remarried when she was eight to a woman named Anna Hostetler, a widow with two children. Jane was raised in a Christian home, presided over by a father who was not just an evangelical, but a perfectionist Christian, believing that once a person has been saved or reborn, his new soul was without sin. The perfectionist could do no wrong. Jane was taught that self-righteousness was a good thing. From an early age, Jane wanted to be a social reformer. She was inspired by the author Ralph Waldo Emerson and reformer and founder of the utopian community New Harmony, Robert Owen. Jane was also inspired by the radical abolitionist John Brown. Jane once confessed to a friend that she had a secret sympathy with Brown's impatience and his determination that something should happen. The route Jane, pl Jane planned to take to become a reformer was to attend medical school in order to practice medicine among the poor. Before attending medical school, Jane wanted to attend the newly opening Smith College in Massachusetts to earn a BA. Jane's father refused, and she resentfully agreed to attend Rockford Female Seminary, as her sisters had before her. Although Jane resented being forced to attend Rockford, while there she was encouraged and mentored by a teacher, Carolyn Potter, who challenged her to take advantage of her time there with self-empowering readings and assignments. Adams later wrote that one should take up her duties as a citizen in the community in which she finds herself, whether that be in the wide world of, or a school, her responsibility is the same. Jane graduated from Rockford at the top of her class. The year after graduation, her father, John Adams, died, leaving Jane as the youngest and only unmarried daughter the duty of taking care of her stepmother, Anna. Jane again put off attending Smith College, as she had always hoped to, and instead attended medical school. Upon completion of her exams at medical school, Jane suffered a mental collapse and severe back pain. While recovering at her family home, she threw herself into becoming the kind of person she thought she should be, selfless and self-disciplined. When Jane had sufficiently recovered, she planned to attend Smith, but was again derailed by a surgery her brother-in-law, Harry, had devised to fix her back, something that had plagued her since childhood. While traveling, Jane read of families suffering overcrowding, neglect, and starvation in London's East End. Jane witnessed this when a missionary took her to view the Mile End Road Market, a five-mile-long market crowded with thousands of people buying decaying meat and fruit and vegetables that were too rotten to eat. Jane wrote of the event that her superficial survey of the misery and wretchedness left her thoroughly sad and perplexed and feeling like a failure because she did nothing. After returning from Europe, Jane continued to care for her stepmother, Anna, but she also continued to read. She read books that inspired her, including books on religion and politics, and a book written by John Stuart Mills titled The Subjection of Women. This book inspired Jane to act. She made plans to visit Europe again with her lifelong friends, Ellen Gates Starr and Sarah Anderson. Unbeknownst to Sarah and Ellen, Jane planned to visit the philanthropic Toynbee Settlement House in London, which she had also read about. Toynbee House took on the problems of urban poverty by providing social services to residents of the city's industrial district. In Toynbee, Jane Addams found a way that would allow her to live among the poor, did not require her to abandon either gracious living or her love of culture, and yet offered universal and democratic fellowship. Toynbee's success incited Adams and Ellen Gates Starr to plan a similar center for Chicago. In 1889, the two women leased a large vacant residence, the former Hull Mansion, on Chicago's industrial west side and opened their doors to the neighboring community, mostly immigrants. 
When Hull House opened, 78% of the population of Chicago were immigrants or children of immigrants, mostly from farming or peasant classes of Europe without industrial skills. These immigrants and workers were paid low wages and lived on the edge of poverty, all while, all while trying to learn English and adjust to urban life. Adams and Starr's loosely woven plan was to have young people with similar backgrounds to their own rent rooms and board in the settlement house, form social ties with the working people in the neighborhood, and along with other volunteers, organize clubs and classes in their spare time. Charity, caring for the sick, elderly, and families in crisis would be provided in a neighborly way, but would not be the focus of Hull House. Jane Adams and Ellen Starr spoke publicly about the needs of the neighborhood, raised money, and convinced other young women of similar social status to help. But Hull House was not an immediate success in the neighborhood. Residents of the 19th Ward were hesitant coming to the settlement house. Some Catholics and Jews believed Adams was another Protestant missionary there to convert them. Working mothers were the first to take advantage of Hull House, leaving their children at the morning kindergarten that a volunteer started, and then came the older children to the social clubs and afternoon classes in the arts. Hull House eventually expanded to offer a range of services that included boarding rooms for female workers, a nursery, a kindergarten, a community kitchen, academic classes and clubs, and space for union activities and meetings. By its second year, Hull House saw up to 2,000 people every week. There were morning kindergarten classes, club meetings for older children in the afternoon, and adult club meetings in the evening, and even courses in what literally became a night school. More and more facilities were added to Hull House. First an art gallery, then a public kitchen, a coffee house, a gymnasium, a swimming pool, a cooperative boarding club for girls, a book bindery, an art studio, a music school, a drama group, a circulating library, an employment bureau, and a labor museum. Gradually, Adam's approach began to change, and she became driven to physically improve her neighborhood. Concerned about the horrible sanitary conditions in the 19th Ward, where her clients' children's played, she installed a garbage incinerator at Hull House. Chicago ignored Jane's reports on the filthy conditions in her ward, so she tried to get a job as the garbage collector. Chicago refused, but in 1895, Adams was appointed the inspector of garbage. As inspector, Adams would make sure that garbage cans were fully emptied and that trash was properly burned. Jane also worked for political campaigns, raised money for Whole House, lobbied for child labor laws and workmen's compensation laws. In her own area of Chicago, she led investigations on midwifery, narcotics consumption, milk supplies, and sanitary conditions. In 1905, Jane Addams was appointed to Chicago's Board of Education and made chairman of the school management committee. In 1908, she participated in the founding of the Chicago School of Civics and Philanthropy, and in the next year became the first woman president of the National Conference of Charities and Corrections. Adams continued to work for social reforms, including women's suffrage, world peace, and against America's entry into World War I. She became chairman of the Women's Peace Party and the presiding officer for six years of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. In 1910, Jane received the first honorary degree ever awarded to a woman by Yale University. Jane Adams never fully regained her health after suffering a heart attack in 1926. The day she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1931, Adams was being admitted to a Baltimore hospital for heart-related issues. She died in 1935, three days after an operation revealed unsuspected cancer. Jane Adams is buried in Cedarville Cemetery, Cedarville, Illinois. Her burial site is located on a family plot which also contains the graves of her father, John H. Adams, and several other family members.